Um, I'm Tavita Spielman, um, a PhD candidate at, at Leiden, uh, now at Fudan. And um, I'm very happy to uh, be able to share some of my very much ongoing uh, uh, research on immigration policy in China, which is part of my PhD project on immigration uh, perspectives and debates in China more, more broadly. Um, so of course this conference is mostly focused on Chinese engagement uh, abroad and I'm mostly looking at domestic uh, developments. So I'm glad I could still come. Um, but also, uh, as, we, as we heard earlier from Professor Lee, like, there are a lot of connections between um, the domestic and, and the global. And I think that's also true for mobility um, and for the specific topic of this paper, which is influences on immigration policy development. It can be quite hard to actually um, yeah, separate the domestic and international influences. Uh, as well. <clears throat> so um, I'm looking at uh, the, some cases of Chinese immigration policy, three um, in this paper, uh, through the lens of external influences. And one reason for this is that, as we all know, uh, policy making in China can be quite opaque. Um, it can be hard to figure out what's actually uh, going on. So one, thing, one way to look at uh, this, I thought, would be to kind of go around and look at research policy dialogue and international organization exchanges to uh, perhaps get, get a better uh, sense of, of some uh, state perspective. So my main method has been semi-structured interviews with people in these networks, including policymakers, but mostly uh, various kinds of uh, researchers and experts. Um, but this lens of external influences is also, uh, I think, interesting in itself because it offers a chance to compare um, immigration policy development in China with that in other countries, and also it offers a case, uh, the case of immigration, um, uh, yeah, to put into the wider literature on uh, influencing and policy in China, which, which is uh, quite substantial, of course. Uh, so in my paper, I look at three trends, which I'll introduce in a couple of minutes, and I try to map out some of the main actors and developments in them. And at this point in my research, that's still quite a descriptive uh, exercise, as there's just like, a lot that I don't know yet, and also, um, um, yeah, it hasn't been studied yet, so there, there's some, some, some value, uh, perhaps, in, in mapping this out. Um, but basically, I find that over the last uh, five or so years, uh, the speed of immigration policy development in China has picked up, and um, I call this a sort of emerging policy uh, field that brings together previous uh, policy areas that already uh, have long histories, um, and the term immigration itself is still very new, at least uh, in China's official discourse, and it's still unclear what it, what it means. So, so I call it immigration policy, but within China, it's not necessarily always called that. <clears throat> um, so the state has become uh, slightly more proactive in what was long, especially for incoming migration, a sensitive, a fairly marginal uh, area of policy development. And I think this normalization can be traced back to two things. Uh, one, like booming exit entry and like a growing acknowledgement of, of that and of the, also the more permanent status of, of foreigners in China uh, and some of the practical challenges this creates for, for state actors. And on the other, um, kind of a, a changing state position uh, on globalization and, and China's role in the world. Um, and as a result, there's now <coughs> a growing space in this policy area for a range of external influences. And I find that various kind of policy entrepreneurs and international and overseas interest groups, overseas Chinese interest groups all currently uh, play uh, a role. And especially international experience and overseas Chinese interests seem, seem quite influ influential. So um, before I get into the cases, a little bit of context. Uh, one body of literature this, this paper aims to contribute to is that on immigration to China, so foreigners in China. China, of course, has a very long uh, outward uh, immigration tradition, which has played a huge role also in the, in the last 40 years. But only more recently, it has started to attract like, larger numbers of foreigners, especially since the, the 2000s, even though on China's population, this is still uh, very small. Uh, so I'm part of a project that is actually um, about foreigners in China more broadly. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, and in this period, state policies have gone from very restrictive. Oh, right. So I'm actually on the next. Hmm. Oh, maybe I forgot. Oh, I put the reset. Oh, yeah. So um, it's gone got, got from very restrictive. And in this like left book, um, Anime Brady has described the huge bureaucracy uh, that has long 
uh, was designed to keep foreigners and Chinese apart um, to, to, to much less so. Like foreigners can now live wherever they want, engage in all kinds of activities. Um, but at the same time, a lot of that bureaucracy is still uh, there, and especially legal reform um, specifying foreigners' rights and duties has been, uh, has been very slow. And the government usually still speaks of exit entry and uh, foreigners rather than of immigration issues or integration in, in a broader sense, all this, although this is now changing. And for this literature, um, it has really developed a lot um, in the last like 15 years and um, within China, especially since around 15 uh, with BRI, there have been a lot more resources and um, uh, yeah, institutes and, and um, um, a lot of this research is, is just now um, kind of a, a hot topic. Someone called it a frontier topic the other day um, within mainland China. And a lot of it focuses on specific foreign communities, but state perspectives, and maybe that's my point that I could should come to a bit quicker, state perspectives have been like under, understudied. Um, while policy research often is more international comparative uh, without looking at Chinese, uh, China's policy development in, in a lot of detail. And secondly, maybe it's interesting to mention here that there's more and more connections being made between this field and uh, existing diaspora research. And of course, that, that makes sense. Like a lot of foreign nationals in China are uh, various kinds of return migrants, but um, those connections are, are more recent often. Um, and very briefly, another literature, uh, as mentioned, is that on policy development. Um, one influential framework here is that of fragmented authoritarianism. Um, from the late like 80s, like Libertal and Oxenberg, which analyzes how bargaining between uh, bureaucratic a actors in China, especially at the same level, can make it really hard to, to get things done. And you could see perhaps from this um, illegible slide that that might be the case for foreigner affairs. It's been like notoriously fragmented, even though now this new national level like state immigration administration is supposed to uh, help with that a bit. And in this uh, literature, there's also been a growing space for external actors to promote and frame policy issues and for the influence of foreign models. And in an article uh, from China Quarterly last year, um, uh, Jane Duckett integrates a lot of these influences into a model she calls uh, network authoritarianism, in which state act actors work with, within various networks uh, that span the domestic, international, state, non-state, and the central local uh, divides. <laughs> but most of this research has been in the Hu Wen era. So she ends her article basically asking, is this still true for the C, uh, for, for the C era? <clears throat> um, and I would now like to uh, move on to the cases. Um, so in the paper um, I submitted, I talk about three cases, the establishment of a SIA, like a, last year, a national level immigration agency. Uh, second, uh, state responses to um, the increase in uh, African uh, migration in Guangzhou and the huge public debate that this caused. And third, a recent trend of exit entry uh, policies targeted exclusively at foreign nationals of Chinese descent. Um, and I uh, think these trends uh, kind of reflect uh, different parts, like different policy spheres, like national, local, transnational, within China's like kind of emerging um, um, policy system. Although this is not necessarily the best uh, deficient, but that's how I, I wrote it now. Um, and I've done most of the interviews in the last months, um, mostly in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. Um, still very much ongoing, and I don't think I have time for all three cases, so I'll spend most of my time on this uh, first one. So last year, uh, the SIA, China's first uh, national level immigration agency, was announced during the MPC as part of this bigger government overhaul, uh, which was mostly about downsizing government. But a few new agencies were announced, like this one and also the Development Cooperation uh, Agency uh, and one for Veteran Affairs. Um, and this new agency is supposed to uh, coordinate, like make and coordinate um, uh, immigration uh, policy and was announced um, in the announcement as being the result of China's increasing state power and, uh, quote, the constant increase in the number of foreigners that come to work and live in China. So in its branding, it's very much focused on incoming migration, but it also deals with uh, the exit entry of Chinese nationals, which are bigger numbers, of course. Um, and actually, most of its policies so far have been aimed at them. Um, it falls under the MPS, 
the Ministry of Public Security, which has left um, a lot of researchers disappointed because it makes it less likely that it will be able to tackle these long-standing fragmentation issues, especially between the MPS and the Foreign Affairs Ministry. Um, but still, it has been also very much welcomed by them. Also, the name, like the na that they actually use the term immigration, uh, perhaps hints at a more comprehensive approach uh, ahead. Although officials still, like I uh, will always emphasize, China is not an immigration country, but it is now a destination uh, country. Uh, but the question remains why it was established at this time. Uh, researchers have been calling for it for over a decade. And actually, the number of foreigners has not really gone up much um, recently, uh, at least so far as we know. There's not a lot of statistics, nothing like in the 2000s. Uh, so what was interesting is that a couple of days after it was announced, like one actor, uh, the Center for China and Globalization, um, published several articles claiming that um, this was completely due to their work, their lobbying. Um, they said that a policy suggestion they submitted through internal channels in 2016 had received the written endorsement, like peace, from no less than six like top leadership, including uh, President Xi and Premier uh, Li Keqiang. Um, in one media report, the director of CCG, Wang Huayao, uh, said that this had exceeded his expectations, but it also was kind of a natural outcome of their 10 years of, of pushing for this. And he said that it was like an unprecedented example of the impact of a think tank, um, like an independent uh, social policy think tank, which is what CCG um, aims to be, and, and it's quite a big one, um, on political decision making. Um, and on among the immigration research community, when you ask people about this, they're like, well, like, there's something to this here, because CCG is uh, very well connected. Um, and uh, Director Wang is deeply embedded in all kinds of, re in a couple of returnees networks. Um, he's on the State Council Expert Advisory Committee. Um, since CCG was established, uh, first they were more working in talent uh, policy, but they've been early with saying that this should be embedded in a broader immigration approach, and they've worked with all kinds of ministries. Um, but at the same time, they were saying, they would say in my interviews that it's unlikely that the SIA can be traced back to one policy recommendation. Um, and an official verified uh, the CCG's account, but also noted that um, is an SIA official, um, that a need for such an agency had already been uh, agreed upon before 2016. He traced it back to 2015. Um, but the account um, fits with what is uniformly described as a very top-down uh, decision, an example of top-level design policy making under President Xi Jinping. Um, and this is kind of further strengthened by if you, what, if you see what has happened in the year after um, various plans that were announced like haven't really uh, at least been made public. Um, the reform is still very much, um, yeah, like discussed between uh, various actors. And um, as one longtime researcher put it, it was an opportunity without a plan. Um, often people will point to the pie, so like this picture and say like, well, that's all it is right now. Um, but for the wider context of this institutional opportunity, they, they credit the BRI, um, which of course was just coming up, or like was just announced uh, in 2015. And um, this different framing of China's role in the world um, seems to have been used um, also for, for, by some actors within the bureaucracy um, to point out that China needs to have the infrastructure to deal with this globalization, uh, including uh, incoming migrants and the rights of Chinese citizens abroad. And this had also led to like, the speed up of China's entry into the IOM uh, in 2016 as a full member. Before that, it was an observing member. Um, and now, uh, SIE, SIA uh, is setting up shop. Um, there's different kinds of uh, like dialogues uh, going on. Um, they're trying to, they said, uh, like diversify their consultancy like uh, circles. Um, CCG is doing a big project for them, but officials are also studying um, immigration models in other countries and writing about them in journals. Um, they're going on a European st study tour uh, for immigration law this summer. Uh, why Europe? Well, then everyone just says, well, because we can't go to the US right now. So there's no deep reasoning, it seems, uh, behind it. Um, but for many of these plans on how these things are now being filled in, uh, there are quite, like, there are longer <laughs> debates to draw on. Um, and so I think that. Um, this should also be seen in the context of more gradual changes of state framing on international immigration. Um, and my interviews point to the role of like about a handful of very active researchers in, um, in this field um, who they say has, have brought the state to think about ideas they were previously not at all uh, thinking about. 
uh, when it comes to um, like foreigner rights and uh, PR, like permanent residency reform and, and legislation. Um, so there's a couple of people who will just show up in all the networks. And often they have studied immigration law abroad, uh, came back, published on this in Chinese when no one had yet, and they were often proactively approached by the state for advice. And usually they will promote like international practices and say that this is basically uh, an inevitable road that, that China also uh, needs to uh, go down. So while the decision seems to have been quite uh, top down, uh, and the direct circumstances still remain a bit mysterious, but fit the BRI mood of 2015, um, a lot of external influences can be uh, identified on uh, the decision to establish finally a national level agency and how it's now being um, implemented. Um, the top leadership did endorse uh, this very decidedly pro-globalization think tank who had lobbied for it. Um, and in combination with some of the needs within the bureaucracy and this long-term framing by researchers, this has now uh, has apparently overcome um, what was also kind of a long-standing resistance to framing China as an immigration country, something that could come with a decision like this. Um, so very briefly on the second and third case, uh, in Guangzhou, which is of course very much a hub for both for research on foreigners and um, uh, immigration. Um, I basically found as the main, um, the main model uh, a lot of local uh, research policy dialogue with some researchers um, developing, developing quite close uh, working relationships with um, immigration authorities. And they say that uh, you can really trace like, um, a trajectory uh, from, from this time into 2009 when African migration became this huge nationwide topic, which is quite unusual in China for foreigners, which is still quite a marginal phenomenon to, to, to become the nationwide topic, um, when it was still very sensitive and they were told not to do research, to a couple years later when they were actively asked for a lot of input, to now again when this window of opportunity seems to have closed a bit again, um, as authorities have decided on a quite restrictive approach. And the role of media is also quite interesting here, um, as this has generated a lot of media attention, and a lot of the researchers also participate in that, although they said, too, that this was getting less useful in their, um, in their perspective because of increasing censorship of the topic. Um, and for policies targeting overseas Chinese, this is, of course, a very big topic in itself. Um, but this is like a news item from a policy from last year, a new five-year visa uh, aimed at like foreign nationals from Chinese uh, um, descent. Um, and I was just wondering, like, of course, there have been all kinds of programs and visas, um, even like, like the visiting relatives one, uh, which have almost exclusively attracted overseas Chinese. Uh, but it's... But, to my knowledge, it's more recent that this would also show up as a, an explicit category in exit entry discourse and in exit entry policies. Um, and this, <clears throat> I've only just started doing interviews on this, but people say this kind of fits um, a trend of diaspora and exit entry bureaucracies working together more. Um, it also fits a trend of like codification of a lot of these uh, programs and campaigns that have been going on and uh, perhaps also says something about how, uh, like how overseas Chinese work has changed under uh, President Xi, but uh, we can talk about that uh, more later. Um, so while double nationality is still like off the table, uh, whatever can be done, what is seen as like what overseas Chinese groups want, although well, it's, it's hard, quite hard to get at the specific of how this went for specific policies, which I still hope to do. Um, but basically this has been a big trend in, in uh, immigration policy. So uh, to conclude, well, I do think these, these three cases, they're all very different, but they all illustrate this like, slightly more proactive approach of the state uh, in China towards immigration. Um, and at least at the national level, which I've, what I've talked about most, there's a discourse of getting more in line with international immigration practices that has really caught on, uh, especially in the last uh, three years. Um, there's a lot to talk about in terms of how this compares like, uh, to, to countries at a, like, at a similar stage of immigration policy development, where often you see early on there's a big influence for a few individuals, uh, at least in, in European uh, countries, um, more recent immigration countries, um, and how this contributes. Well, I don't, won't get into the, the literature there then. 
Uh, but perhaps finally, there's also, of course, a lot of uncertainty in how this will go forward. Um, as I'm sure we'll talk about these days, uh, the globalization discourse of 2015, 16 is already very different now in 2019 with the, with the trade war and BRI not going great. Um, and so this state debate that has rebalanced, like one way, could of course become more conservative again uh, too. Uh, and that's without even mentioning all the contradictions and Chinese characteristics or whatever you want to call them uh, in how these things are uh, now uh, executed. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions.